Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Midday Live on TV3, coming to you from our studio here at Adesanwe in Accra. My name is Martin Esiedu Dati, coming up within the next one hour. Aggrieved residents of Ibuakwa in the Ashanti region protest over stalled Sofo Line Ibuakwa Road project and other deplorable roads in the municipality. Also coming up, women encouraged to join the maritime profession as the world marks Maritime Day today. Also in the bulletin, health workers in Dambaga overwhelmed by scabies treatment and polio vaccination underway in the municipality. On the international front, ex France President Jacques Chirac has died aged 86. Thank you very much for staying with us. We have details of all these stories and more, including business, sports, entertainment. And uh, if we get time, we'll read some of your comments that you're sending to the program. Let's go to details of the stories now. And hundreds of aggrieved residents of Ibuakwa in the Ashanti region are demonstrating over the stalled Sofo Line Ibuakwa project, as well as other deplorable roads in the Ekiwanwa um, Bieja municipality. Is dubbed enough is enough. Uh, the protesters say that they cannot be taken for granted by the ruling NPP after voting the party to solve that particular problem. William Evans Inkum is our Ashanti regional correspondent and has come through with his report. For the past two hours, these aggrieved residents of Aguapa have been demonstrating against stalled road projects within the Achuma and Wabiaja municipality. They claim that most of the roads lying within this particular municipality have become death trap. But let me engage some of the conveners or one of the conveners to tell us what really the problem is. So you have been complaining bitterly about the poor nature of your road network. What really has kind of pushed you onto the street to spit one who said red to the government. The government made that understood. That was 24th of last year. That he had given what 30 million Ghana to the Chinese uh, Chinese uh, contractor to resume the second phase of what the Abuakwa road. Eh? So he wanted to find out from the government where is the that 30 million that he gave to the Chinese contractor, Geo Company Limited. Where is the 30 million? He instructed the government uh, the co uh, contractor to resume the second phase, start the second phase of this. Uh, where is the money? We have understood that the money has been diverted to what? One district, one factory. We wanted to find out from the government where is the, exactly the money what goes to where? Where the money went? So let them, we need what? Transparency, credibility, and transparency. You understand? So account for us where our money goes. He gave us, there's a graphic online. That government has given me what 30 million government uh, cities to what the Chinese what contractor to start what second phase of what a Buakwa to Fulan Road. But up to now, work has not. We have never seen even one machine on this road. So we, we are appealing to the government to come out, tell us the people of Akema where the money, who did he give the money to? All right. So let me also say that this particular demonstration comes on the heels of an earlier notice served by the Asante Youth Association and Kumasi Youth Association. They claim that they will also be hit in the streets tomorrow to protest against similar issues. From Abuakwa in the Achoma Nwabiaja municipality of the Ashanti region, I am William Evans Inkum. Back to you, studios. All right, so what we are doing is to keep an eye on that particular project, which is in the Ashanti region. However, it is part of our campaign here to draw government's attention and keep the campaign for whichever government will come uh, into power, whether from the, the next election or uh, after that, to make sure that projects that have been started already are completed at least for the benefit of the Ghanaian uh, taxpayer whose money is being pumped into those kinds of projects. So uh, the particular project that our reporter just talked about is a Sofo Line Interchange. Now, 
It is an 11 kilometer six lane um, dual carriage way with five underpasses for pedestrians. And if you can see on your screens, the picture is beautiful. If this interchange is completed, we are likely to have one of the very, uh, one of the best interchanges in the Ashanti region. It was started uh, under the former President Kufu administration in 2007 and was uh, given to uh, a contractor. It was awarded uh, in 2007 with plans that within three years, it should be completed. That is in 2010. By 2010, that project should have been completed. However, it stalled. The project uh, started work, and if you look at the, 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 the distance it was supposed to cover, it was supposed to start from the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital roundabout in the Ashanti region, Kumasi specifically, and would be ending at the Ebuakwa, uh, at Ebuakwa in the Echiwa Inwabieja municipality. Projects, however, stalled for several years due to lack of funding or funding challenges. And uh, information we gathered indicate that in August last year, um, uh, at the inauguration of an affordable housing project in the Ashanti region, Preston Akufuado um, said that he had directed the finance minister to release an amount of $27 million for the commencement of the phase two of this project. Even the phase one was not fully completed. And so that is information we've, we, we've been able to gather. And following that order given by the president to the finance ministry, we are told that the money was released. And that's uh, the point we are looking at now, that um, the money was released by the finance ministry and was paid. So China Geo Construction Limited was the construction company that was handling the interchange. Now they were owed some money and have been paid some $30 million. And if you heard from the protesters, they were saying that where is that money? Because they've also been following the development and they know or have read that that money has been given out. Later that year, that's in November 2018, uh, the roads minister, uh, uh, Mr. Amuakwata, said that government had settled the 30 million, uh, doll, 30 million Ghana city debt that was owed the contractor. So work is expected to commence or at least be completed. Under the NDC government, very little was done. Now a new government is in, is in place, that's the NPP. And again, we are, are yet to see something concrete being done on that interchange. Is part of our campaign here, hashtag complete abandoned projects. And uh, we'll keep an eye on it and at least try and get government to push their attention towards some of these abandoned projects. And it cuts across, not just roads, but today our concentration is on this road that would serve not just the people there, but other adjoining cities and communities that would be needing that road. It would also reduce the level of traffic in that part of the, of, of the country, the Ashanti region uh, specifically. Why haven't we seen action on this road? What is happening? What is the government saying? Why is it that it has taken this long for some action to be taken? Stay with us. The campaign is on. Join this campaign. Let's draw government's attention. At least give us answers as to why these projects are still in the states they are in right from 2007 up until now. This is still made live on TV3. Let's move away from the Ashanti region now and move on to some other stories now. So. Ghana joined the global uh, maritime community to celebrate Maritime Day with uh, a series of a serious demand also uh, to empower women to join that industry or at least be active partakers in that industry. Former Ghana Shippers Authority boss and a maritime law consultant, Dr. Kofi Mbia, called for gender balance to enable women uh, to have better representation when it comes to the decision-making process. He spoke exclusively to TV3's Josephine Frimpong have indicated that we have seen some improvement over time. There is still a long way. Measures are being taken. Today there is a concerted effort. You've just talked about World Maritime Day and you have talked about the theme for World Maritime Day. You know, the theme, empowering women in the maritime community. You know, that tells you that there is a focus on that area. And consequently, the ingredients that need to be put in place ought to be there so that we can get women to play an enormous role in the maritime industry. The good thing that is happening today is that, you know, hitherto, I, I can't recall, but hitherto, we didn't have the Women in Shipping and Trading Association, WISTA, you know, we didn't have WEMESA, you know, we didn't have WIMA, you know. Today, we have a lot of women in maritime associations, you know, have now been formed at the national, at the regional, at the international level. And all of these 
are creating awareness in terms of what women can do as far as the maritime sector is concerned. And still on maritime related stories, because today is World Maritime Day, the president for Women's International and Shipping Association, Wista Ghana, Jamilat Mahama, is worried that only 2% of women are into maritime transport industry. She said there are more jobs available for women who uh, take up courses in maritime. Speaking at this year's Ghana's Maritime Week celebration and career guidance talk in Accra, President for Women's International and Chippy Association, Wister Ghana, Jamilia Mahama called on women to venture into the sector. It's not just being on water. Water, so the men are there. Why can't we? We are all human. You've just seen that we have about two ship captains with us. They move the ships and nothing happens. It's a very safe job. She added there are jobs available for them. There are so many jobs. We have maritime lawyers. We have marine insurance underwriters. We have chartered ship brokers. We have uh, marine administrators. We have marine engineers. We have ship captains. We have nurses. We have cooks or chefs on board the vessel. We have chandlers who are onshore and provide the vessels with what they need. The Deputy General Manager of Ghana Maritime Authority, Yao Akosa, entry also expressed worry on the number of women in the maritime industry. Uh, we find out that women in the industry are very limited. 2% of the entire population of seafarers are only women. As part of the week, we wanted to bring girls together, secondary school girls, and actually expose them to the opportunities in the maritime industry. World Maritime Day is marked to highlight the importance of safe shipping, marine environment and security. About 80% of world trade is through marine transport. Uh, there's some success story there because uh, she is determined to change the narrative about women. Having worked hard to become Ghana's first marine pilot in the overwhelmingly male-dominated industry, uh, Josephine Frimpong has been spending a day with Ama Thanki, uh, who is at the t port of Takrade, to explore how she challenged the status quo to hold on to her dream that she cherishes. My name is Henrietta Ama Thanki. I'm a marine pilot at GPH Igapoa, Takrade. I was here for my national service, and then after my national service, I was taking on and then being the first woman in the environment, I took the opportunity to learn how to handle the tags. I became a tag master and then I was promoted to be a pilot. I'm now a marine pilot. Takwadi is the, is the only port with female pilot in GPHA. I have here seven pilots and Amma is one of them. She works like any of the males. The sea stole her heart with its exquisite beauty. Ama Tanki says that is the long and short of her story and you can easily see what she means. We have a local knowledge of the port so anytime a vessel is coming inside or going out of the port we go as an advisor to the captain and then we cone the vessel in and out of the port. On a typical day like this her tax is to berth this vessel coming into the port to load manganese among others. Her job is described as the most dangerous in the world at night because several pilots have died embarking and disembarking on a moving vessel. Women in the industry accounts for only 2%. Out of the world, 1.2 million seafarers, according to the International Labour Organization. A lot of challenges. Men don't want to be competed with, especially being a woman. They don't really like it, so they'll do everything to push you out. But if you show them that you are here to stay and you know what you're about, and then you give them the respect that they need, they'll give it to you back and then you work with them. Yes, I have a family, I have three kids. It's challenging combining the two, I mean, but you have to draw the line. Um, uh, it's a little tough. No, if you see her, her nature, she is the, the boy type. 
No wonder she come this far. Every September 26th is used to recognize and celebrate industry players in the maritime space. This year's theme is focused on empowering women in the community. The sea is not as scary as it looks. And once you are determined and focused, you can make it. And Ama is such a person who is flying high the flag of Ghana in the sub-region as the first female pilot. The sentiments of a woman whose eyes are set on the prize being Ghana's first marine pilot Certainly, there's no stopping for Amatanki. Josephine Frempon, TV3 News, Port of Takrani. That's some success story there, and congratulations to Amatanki. Let's stay on issues regarding women and women empowerment. So, female police recruits have swept several awards at this year's National Police Pass Out Ceremony. Police women uh, recruit. Uh, Theresa Safu Bones scored a total of 1,568 out of 1,600 to emerge the overall best recruit in the second passing out for 2019. Here's a report by Peter Kwao Adato. Police woman recruit PWR Theresa Safu Bonsu and 180 other young men and women were recruited into the National Police Training Academy in February this year. This was after they passed through the vigorous police recruitment exercise successfully. For six months, PWR Theresa Safo Bonsu and her colleagues have undergone vigorous basic police training programs to transform them into police constables. The intensive training has prepared, equipped and toughened them with both physical and mental fitness ready to support the internal security of the country. Courses undertaken during the six months included human rights, criminal investigations, criminal law, information and communication technology, practical police duties, criminal procedures, police service instructions, crime scene management, professional policing ethics, intelligence gathering, and law of evidence. They were again taught child-friendly policing, weapon handling, drill physical training conduct, and discipline among others. Police woman recruit PWR Theresa Safo Bonsu scored 1,568 out of a total of 1,600 for all disciplines to emerge the overall best recruits. PWR Philomena Kwanza tops as the most skilled recruit in precision shooting, whilst PWR Ama Boatema beat all 108 recruits in drills. Other awards winners are PWR Cecilia Echampon, who emerged as the best in conduct, PWR Gladys Echampoma, who won the best in child-friendly policing, with the only male general recruit Clement Amwa taking the best in physical training. Another significant feature witnessed during the passing out ceremony was the fact that the recruits took charge of the parade command aside the highly disciplined display. Acting Inspector General of Police James Opon Buenu is convinced the recruits who apply the knowledge acquired in the best interest of the country. I'm fully convinced that they will apply the knowledge acquired in the best interest of our dear country. He underscored the growing sophistication in crime and criminal activities calling for public support. Because effective crime management is anchored on the principle of shared responsibility between the police and the public that it serves. The recruit will serve a mandatory probationary period of 18 months during which their performance and conduct will be monitored and assessed. Those who fill the probationary service will be discharged from the service. Congratulations to all the ladies there and to all the recruits who've passed up. Um, let's go to the presidency now. Of course, President Akufuado has charged world leaders to support Africa fight poverty as it degrades the developed and developing world. Um, addressing the 74th session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York, the president called for an end to foreign exploitation 
of the African continent, adding it breeds unfairness in the economic order and undermines the fight against poverty. The responsibility is ours as individual sovereign countries, not only to aim at reducing poverty, but actually to create prosperity for all our citizens. We in Ghana certainly are engaged in fighting to eradicate poverty from our country. If the world wants to marshal all its undoubted energies to support this fight, there cannot be a better start than an acknowledgement and a consensus among the nations of the world that indeed poverty anywhere degrades us all, whether in the developed or developing world. The young people of the world, especially the youth of Ghana and Africa, have demonstrated their ingenuity and innovative prowess, and we need to enlist them fully in the fight. It would be an easier battle, of course, if trade practices were seen to be more equitable and fairer. The question always remains whether the rich nations are prepared for an equitable and fair trading order. It appears that they are not, and we have thus to continue to fight for a fairer world economic order. It should not be lost on anyone that the minerals on which the world depends to move industry and manufacturing are mostly available in Africa. And yet we, who own these fundamental resources by birthright, have remained poor, whilst our minerals have brought vast wealth to nations and peoples outside our continent. A government has warned against the ridiculing of the information put out on the alleged plot to take over governance targeted at the presidency. At a news conference, Deputy Information Minister Pius Enam Hajide stressed that government came to that conclusion about a coup plot after more than a year's investigation and surveillance. We want to discourage uh, strongly attempts by sections uh, of uh, our population, especially on social media and even sometimes uh, in traditional media by uh, acclaimed, uh, I mean self-acclaimed uh, security and intelligence experts to attempt to ridicule what information the government has put out. Uh, this is a result of sustained surveillance. And it is indeed true that the, the X-ray container at the Citadel Hospital belonging to Dr. McPam uh, had been turned into a weapons manufacturing uh, uh, facility. Uh, several uh, improvised explosive devices were manufactured there. It is true uh, that uh, chemicals were purchased from the Kolebu Teaching Hospital for the manufacture of these devices. These devices. It is true that uh, Mr. McPam made contact uh, with a gentleman who works at the base workshop at the Burma camp, offered him money to uh, supply 10 AK-47 ri rifles. It is true that there is a plan uh, which indicates strategic uh, installations and facilities that were to be targeted at the H hour. Uh, and it is also true that there was a test firing of the weapons that were produced uh, at uh, these uh, makeshift, if you may, uh, arms manufacturing facility that we described. It is unfortunate that uh, sections of the Ghanaian public will attempt to ridicule this information. And we all know, history reminds us, that the assassination of the former president of the United States of America, John F. Kennedy, took a bullet. Uh, just one person with, uh, with a gun was arrested. And the security uh, agencies, after having convinced themselves that there was clear and present danger, especially after the firepower that was manufactured was successfully tested 
the security experts came to the conclusion that there was a clear and present danger and went ahead to arrest these persons. I think that the attempt uh, from some quarters to, ridic to ridicule this is rather unfortunate uh, and should, be, should not be encouraged. Let's go to the northern part of the country now. The Gambaga Municipal Director of Education, Howa Yusuf, um, has shut down the Daglibori, let me take it again, has shut down the Daglibori Primary and Junior High School following the spread of scabies. This was after medical professionals from the Gambaga Municipal Health Directorate advised a shutdown following the widespread of the scabies in the community. Let's watch this. We should be targeting schools where the outbreak is. Okay. If one or two children in a particular school has it and it has been confirmed by our health workers, yes, we have the right to close down such schools so that uh, it might not escalate because we are even all at risk. She said it was imperative to shut down the school following fresh cases of scabies recorded in the area. Madam Howard disclosed the closure was an expert advice from the health directorate. Meanwhile, 42 students of the Gambaga Girls Senior High School are said to have reported to school authorities of some skin disease suspected to be scabies. The health master of the school, Jawola Mohammed, indicated some students reported that they were feeling itchy. Two out of the 42 female students are said to be residents of the Blebuari community, which first recorded the scabies infections. Let's stay on that particular story a while longer. Now, the Gambaga Municipal uh, Director of Health Services, Dr. Mark Abugri, has revealed seven medical personnel have been deployed to handle the treatment of scabies in parts of the municipality, uh, where we are told that at least 16 communities in the Gambaga Municipality have been identified uh, as being infected with scabies. Um, he, he said that the medical personnel have also taken the added task of a polio vaccination exercise ongoing in the area. Well, um, I don't know who said the numbers, the, the personnel were not enough. Uh, we had about seven people on the ground uh, handling the situation. And then um, we are currently having an exercise, that's the polio vaccination. And uh, most of the people are engaged in it. So, um, you know, we have to multitask. We have to do more than, we, 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 we are not going to be able to close down facilities because we have to handle skates. So the officers around are those that we are uh, using. Okay. Uh, we gave them skate size uh, and then uh, uh, some painkillers and then uh, some antihistamines. So that was the treatment that we gave to them yesterday. Let's stay on this subject matter because uh, we want to speak to our correspondent there. Um, we're crossing over to talk to Mashud Mahama about this and why the health authorities there deemed it fit to release the students instead of quarantining them and helping or giving them treatment. Wouldn't they rather go and spread this case that we are told about? Mashud, good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Uh, to start with, we are told that the school uh, has been shut down, a secondary school has been shut down, and the students have been asked to go home and seek treatment. Have they left? And how is the community treating this news that persons who have been affected have been asked to leave? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the the, the, the Bull Bally Junior High and the Junior High School, I'm uh, sorry, the, the Bull Bally Primary School and Junior High, they have been closed down to allow treatment. But the Gambaga Girls uh, Senior High School, that hasn't been closed down yet. Uh, it was 42 of their students were infected with, uh, I mean, were suspected to uh, kind of uh, uh, be infected with, with the disease. They were referred to the Gambaga Health Center uh, for medical checkup. What we can confirm uh, from the headmistress of the school is that two of the students have actually been confirmed to be infected with the CD disease. And these two students are actually coming from the Bible uh, school. But what they've done is that they've uh, they advised this uh, uh, from the medical director. All the 42 students have been asked to come back to campus. But what they are doing at the moment, 
uh, the two students that have been uh, kind of confirmed to have, have been infected with the, with the disease will be isolated into a separate dormitory and special attention will be given to them while the 40 other students are paid key attention to. Uh, what we also got it from the health director was that uh, uh, considering what is happening, what is going on at the moment, they are still at the I mean, This is the third day uh, the teams are still handling patients at the Bulbari where we captured the story. But there are several communities that have been affected with uh, this kind of uh, disease. They have gathered that 16 communities in the municipality have been affected. But information they are, and the report they are gathering, again, is that additional 13 communities have reported to them of being infected with this disease, which they are yet to verify. So right, but Mashu, do we, know, do we know how this spreads, how the disease, is it, is it by, you know, contact with another person that it spreads, or it is in some pipe-borne water, or it's airborne? How, is it, how does it spread? The disease is spread, according to a health director, through contact. So if a person is infected and get, I mean, you get closer to such a person, maybe you, 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 you kind of uh, use the same sponge or if you like, uh, the person sweats and gets in contact with you, mm. definitely you will be infected with the disease. That is the mode of spread of okay. disease. Okay. Uh, my final question would be, we are told that some other um, uh, exercise is ongoing, the polio vaccination. How is that one going? Well, that is also going uh, smoothly, but uh, the health director told us that actually the vaccination is now making, uh, I mean, putting stress on their team because that means that uh, they will have to monitor, they will have to take care of uh, the CBS uh, community and at the same time ensure that they go out to vaccinate uh, children with this school use. But what they are doing at the moment is that they are trying to acquire more of uh, the medicine so that they can supply to the various health centers in the municipality so that they would advise and make announcements for people that are infected to go to those health centers and receive treatment, rather than waiting for the medical team to come to the communities one after the other. Because okay. considering what they capture, the numbers seem to be rising. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mashud Mahama. Uh, he's our correspondent there and uh, uh, giving us an update on that outbreak, the skin disease, scabies. Uh, we're told it's spread through contact so we are calling on the health authorities to at least intensify uh, getting some aid to the persons affected to reduce the spread of it. We'll keep an eye on it and keep you posted in subsequent bulletins. Now let's come down to uh, the Great Accra region. Of course, six of the accused persons in connection with the murder of two police men at Kaswa Budumburam in the central region have been set free by the Kaneshi District Court. According to the prosecution, based on latest development, charges against the six have been dropped, leaving only Eric Kujudia, who will be standing trial for the murder of the two police officers. Appearing before the Kaneshi District Court, the prosecutor, Sylvester Asari, told the court that the charges preferred against the, charges preferred against the six accused persons were dropped since no evidence um, have been found against them in connection with the murder of Sergeant Michael Jamasi, a service driver, and Lance Corporal Awal Mohammed. A new charge sheet was therefore presented to the court, uh, proffering fresh charges against Eric Dia, um, Isaac Emisa, Ibrahim uh, Zakaria, Isaac Mensa, Oblitekomi, Victor Yire, and Fatal Ahmed. Will, uh, they are the persons who will go through the necessary documentations to see their exit from the grips of the Ghana Police Service. So those are live images on your screens from the court there. This is still Midday Live on TV3. We take a quick breather. When we return, we'll let you know what's happening in the world of business. Then sports will follow. We have entertainment as well. Stay. Thank you for staying with us. Let's do some business news now. The central bank has announced that it would, um, from the 1st of October 2019, start forward sale purchases of Forex. In a notice on guidelines issued to Forex dealers, the Bank of Ghana said that the initiative, which comes on the back of improved liquidity on the market and would deepen the foreign exchange market. Foreign exchange dealers currently make Forex purchases through spot sales, that is, a purchase made on a day and settlements done in two days. 
In addition to the auction guidelines, the central bank said that all authorized foreign exchange dealer banks shall also comply with the provisions of the Code of Conduct for the Interbank Forex Exchange Market in Ghana. The auction shall be held under conditions such as the amount on offer being $50 million. Maximum bid of a single bid shall not exceed 10% of the announced auction target. The cumulative volume of all bids from any single bank shall not exceed 20% of the announced target for the auction. Currency analyst Stanley Monte says this is a good move by the regulator. People should not just get up and sell, buy or sell foreign currency. You need to register an institution. And I think the reporting framework also has to be improved. Maximum bids submitted shall not exceed three bids per authorized dealer bank. Successful banks will be expected to provide the required CDs on trade date in the case where they are buying a forward contract. In other businesses this afternoon, from the 1st of January 2020, facility owners will not be required to pay certified wiring electricians for inspections conducted. The moratorium on engaging uncertified persons for inspections end on the 3rd of December. According to Energy Commission, there are now 8,980 certified electrical wiring technicians nationwide. Of the number, 5,539 are for domestic electrical installations, 2,849 for commercial electrical installations, 450 are certified for industrial, while 142 are inspectors. Out of the 1,492 wiring electricians who registered for the Energy Commission's May-June 2019 module certification, 1,179 were certified, representing 79% pass. Lead officer of the electrical wiring program at the Energy Commission, Stephen Yomo, noted from January 1 next year, property owners would be required to use only certified electricians and inspectors. Temporary arrangements were made since 2017 to allow facility owners who still engage the services of uncertified persons. This temporary arrangement ends 31st December 2019. And until then, facility owners who continue to engage the services of uncertified persons shall pay for inspection and testing charges, including the cost of corrections made by the CWP. Deputy Director in Charge of Power Distribution at the Energy Ministry, Suleiman Abubakari, called for compliance with the electrical code. This electricity is used, you know, uh, safely. That is why we've joined the crusade of ensuring, of um, helping the Energy Commission, passing, I mean, sending to Parliament and getting the electrical wiring legislation passed. And in that legislation, it's incumbent on every user of electricity to use it safely, to ensure that whoever installs it for them, both the user and the person who installs it, you know, follows a code that, the, that, that is the electricity code. An engineer at the Energy Commission, Dr. George Boatin, cautioned the newly certified wiring technicians against engaging in bad practices. DO2 Michael Atokosa of the Ghana National Fire Service observed the training, certification and the use of certified electricians will reduce fires caused by electrical wiring. It used to be that most of the fires we recorded were initiated by electricity and when we, we start rolling out this initiative, it helped reducing and working together with fire service, I, I believe that if we reduce it to the minimum uh, level and if possible eradicate fire outbreak that were initiated by electricity. With the Ghana Electrical Wiring Regulations 2011 LI 2008 passed and a building code in place, the certified electricians and inspectors are legally entitled to undertake indoor and outdoor installations. That's it for Business on Midday Live. We'll be back with the latest in the world of sports. Stay with us. Good afternoon. Let's delve into the world of sports. My name is Thierry Now, so far, the talk has been centered on the presidential candidates who have likewise marketed loudly enough ahead of the elections on October 25. But it's worth taking a close look at the contest on the flanks. And here's a report on that race for the Executive Council. 
16 aspirants are contesting for 8 positions available to the Premier League and Division 1 League. There are extra 2 slots on the Executive Council allowed for Regional Football Association Chairman. Several bigwigs in Ghana football are contesting for seats on the highest decision-making table. Randy Abbey, a former Executive Committee member and president of Hearts of Lions, says he is taking calculated steps in his bid for a seat on the table with the highest decision-makers in Ghana football. I'm vying to be on the Executive Council. Whoever is president, I'll work with. I'm still working with my delegates. I'm talking to them. I'm convincing them. Incidentally, you know, I went to class one before I got to class two. <laughs> Known to be a man with fresh ideas, Ashgo Chief Executive Officer Freddy Champong also confirms his ambition while insisting the aim is to improve the fortunes of football in Ghana. I manage Asante Good. Uh, probably the biggest club in terms of infrastructure and everything, in terms of the staff size and infrastructure and everything. And so, and um, with the job I've done with seven of various committees at the FA and um, the little I've done with CAF, I think that um, I'll be able to do this. Football must 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 develop must be developed in Ghana. I think that we need to offer something different to be able to uh, stand out as uh, when when it is that you want to compare the new ESCO to the past ESCO. Other names confirmed to be contesting. R. George Amwako, Samir Nim Ado, Dr. Tony Aubin, Nana Odro Safo, Albert Komi, among others. There are four aspirants contesting for the one slot for women on the Executive Council as well. It's a pivotal moment in the quest to freshen up Ghana football, but the chase for the positions will certainly not be a walk in the park for anyone, not even those who held dear these positions under the old administration. All right, so still at the offices of the Ghana Football Association, the vetting committee for the upcoming GFA elections has begun work from uh, today, that's uh, September 26th to October 4th, that's next week, Thursday. All our aspirants are expected to appear before the panel uh, within the period announced by the normalization committee after satisfying all prerequisite measures put in place. The vetting committee will screen candidates for the president's position the Executive Council and the Regional Football Association Chairman. Members of the committee comprise the Chairman of the Committee Lawyer Mr. Frank Davis with Corporate Governance Consultant and Legal Practitioner Mrs. Marian Bano and Lawyer Emmanuel Dakwa as members. Other members are Mr. Reginald Lai, a Marketing and Business Executive and Mr. Richard Akukavi, a Sports Administrator and Legal Practitioner. The GFA election is slated for October 25. So it's departure day for the Ghanaian clubs, uh, you know, in the CAF competition. So let's listen to this particular one. Now, Ashanti Gold will leave uh, Ghana for Morocco. That's uh, later today to tackle Ares Bekani in second leg of the CAF Confederations Cup first round. The team, uh, you know, has departed, uh, you know, Obwasi has actually arrived in Accra. And I expected to fly from the Kotoka International Airport to the North African nation uh, by 2 p.m., on Wednesday, Ashanti Gold won the first leg 3-2 in Obuase about a fortnight ago. 19 players travelled with the team to the capital. One will be dropped for the rest to make the journey to Morocco. Also remember, Kumasi Asante Kotoko uh, also to play their return leg against the Tuadu Sahel in the CAF Champions League after they won the first leg fixture 2-0. Okay, so let's go straight abroad now, and that is in England. And after last night's EFL, and of course, a Tuesday night's EFL Cup matches, there's a fourth round. That was a third round, and these are the fixtures going forward. Of course, tasty among these are Chelsea against Manchester United. That should be at Stamford Bridge. Liverpool also at Anfield against Arsenal. There's Aston Villa against Wolverhampton Wanderers. There's Burton against Leicester uh, City. Colchester will be facing Crawley Town. Crawley Town. And then there's Oxford, who actually beat Premier League side West Ham United by four goals to zero. They will be facing Sunderland. There's Manchester City against Southampton. These are the fixtures in the fourth round. It's looking quite interesting because the Premier League side seemingly are taking this competition more seriously by the uh, season. Anyway, that's end uh, the sports here on Media Live with me, Theo Inyan. We'll bring you some more sports later at, uh, on News 360. Keep watching TV3. 
in entertainment news this afternoon. It was one of the 2000's biggest hit songs, and uh, rightly so. It took the scene, the music scene, by storm. It gained popularity on the street and dominated the playlist on radio thanks to the controversial lyrics. On Throwback Today, we we'll put a spotlight on Oboa's 2002 classic, Miss Daye Namini Wobe Bishe Jaye. What is the story behind that song? Watch this. Born by Soseku for hip life musician of Bo's 2002 hit, Mason Daye remains the favorite of many music enthusiasts. The lyrics tell the story of a young guy who found himself in a relationship with a married woman. Despite being advised to stop the abominable act, he continued. They enjoyed their morals affair only to realize one day that it was judgment day. So he finds out that he's living in sin and it's judgment day. So he kneels down and he prays and asks God for forgiveness so that his soul will be saved. For reasons best known to them, some listeners believe the song promoted promiscuous lifestyle. A boy insists the 2002 classic is a gospel song. Now it's a clear song telling everybody who is living that don't live in sin because judgment day can meet you in sin. And so repent from your sin. Repent from your sinful life so that on judgment day you will be able to go to where those who are in paradise will go to. It's a powerful gospel song. Obuo feels it's a fair opinion to think Misundai is a secular song, but he strongly believes the song is a great gospel tune. And I've, I've debated this on many, many uh, platforms. Uh, the whole Misundai concept is someone asking for forgiveness after making a mistake, or you could say after committing sin you know and the person turning to God through Jesus Christ and asking that he be forgiven because the Bible says it clearly that the you know that Christ is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins All right, so uh, that's it for the bulletin. It came your way from our studio here at Adesawe in Accra. My name is Martin Asiudu Dati. Thank you very much for watching. There is more news on our website, 3news.com. Do have a good afternoon, and as always, stay positive. Bye for now.